Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm one of the founders of TomTom. Tom. We started the business 25 years ago. And it took us a while to figure out how we wanted to live our lives and what we wanted to do. But finally, we settled and trained our binoculars on navigation. And that was in, uh, at around uh, 2000 when we started to put our best engineers and all our efforts and everything we could do on solving that problem of how to go from A to B without getting lost. And it amuses me that a lot of people here in this, in this room probably have never driven with a paper map or a street guide. And that is kind of testament of how things can, fast things can go. Our products were adapted faster than any other technology uh, previously. And yes, that includes mobile phones, faxes, computers, and what have you. In, in a very short period of time, we sold 80 million devices. And today, our maps and our navigation technology are used in hundreds of millions of phones, in cars, and of course, on PNDs. But today, we are at the eve of something that is, again, much bigger than what we tried to do in uh, early 2000. We are at the eve of the self-driving car and getting that to work. And not just us, but there's a whole industry of companies and big money flowing in, solving and cracking that significant technical problem of driving cars without drivers. Now, making predictions is, is, is always dangerous, especially when it involves the future, but people, and people are getting it wrong all the time. And all the focus now is on solving the technical issues and the technical challenges that we have to, to get the technology to work in the first place. But there's very little thinking and thought and consensus about what that will do to society, what the world will look like if this technology takes off, will it take off, and what will the world look like if it does? But before we go there, let's try to uh, identify what is the problem is that we are trying to solve here. The, the motor car, uh, the first motor car was developed by Carl Benz, it was I think 1886 or something like that, and he put an engine on what was essentially a carriage. But it took another 20 years for the technology to become mainstream, and Henry Ford developed the T Ford. I think it was around 1906 or something like that. Uh, and, and since then, for the previous hundreds, hundred years, the industry has tried to incrementally improve cars, making them cheaper, making them more efficient, making them safer, making pollute them less. Uh, and it's been a fantastic achievement, and we have and cars have, have contributed to freedom, enjoying of driving, they have enabled commerce, they have changed the planet that we work on. But we have also paid a high price for that mobility. One of the, the, the big problems is, is road fatal fatalities. Every year, one and a quarter million of people die in traffic. One and a quarter million. That is about 40 buses full of people driving off the cliff every day. That's the equivalent of about 50 full aeroplanes crashing every week. And also, the, um, uh, and then there are the other problems of pollution, of congestion, of wasting time. And driving is not cheap. Despite all the progress we've made in making it more efficient, an average household will still pay, spend approximately 10 to 15% of their income on a car. And that's spending 10 to 15% of your income on a piece of kit that does nothing 90% of the time. So the, the problem, the benefit of solving that issue, making that more bearable on the planet, on your wallet, the benefits of that are so huge that I have no doubt that technology will save that, will solve that problem for us. I have no doubt that we will be in a position to have self-driving cars driving safely around the world. I don't think that technology is going to be the problem. 
I think it will take time to adapt. I think it will time, I think regulators will slow things down. What, what the technology has learned us and what the, uh, the tech firm have learned us and what Moore's law have, has learned us is that there are in those big transitions, although they are fantastically, tremendously profitable for society as a whole, there are also a lot of losers and a few winners. If you look at what the world will look like in, when this technology uh, uh, takes off, then driving is no longer a car, but driving will be an app on your phone, very much like Uber. Think Uber on steroids. Think about the uh, last step before we go to the mass transponder. Mobility that is available at the press of a button, that is cheap, that is available. And that app will be rated, and it will be rated on efficiency, on reliability, on cost. And that's where the industry is preparing for. And I think that will happen. I think that will happen in the next, let's say, 10 years. I think in the next five years, we will have cars that are safer than human-driven cars. Not safe enough for mass deployment but safer than human driving cars. I think that it will then take another five years for those cars to mature, to incorporate user feedback, to harden the technology, to make it better. And then I think you will start to see you know, all sorts of companies emerging that will start to deploy that technology in a commercial way. And the benefits, of course, are when this technology becomes available at scale because then it will be computers that will highly optimize available capacity and match that with available demand and price that flexibly depending on congestion, depending on the overall demand. Algorithms will make sure, massive algorithms based on massive amount of data will make sure that that mobility is applied in a much more cost-effective way than what we can currently achieve with the traditional car. And in that world, there will be winners and losers, as I said. I think the cars that we, of the future, we will need less of them. They will be cheaper. And there will be a couple of companies who will have sufficient scale and capital and a customer base that will deploy that technology and that mobility in a cost-effective way. Um, the infrastructure will also look different. A lot of our valuable space today is occupied by cars. Most, some of the most valuable space in cities is used by cars. And we will still have, when we have autonomous driving uh, deployed on a large scale, we will still have traffic jams. But those traffic jams will move at 300 kilometers per hour. And it will not be in two lanes, but it will be in eight lanes and that those eight lanes will occupy the same amount of space as the old-fashioned dual carriageway. Carriages will be different. They will have no daylight. It's companies like Amazon who know how to stack goods and find them back and distribute them. That technology will be used for storing cars and charging cars. And the car maker of today of tomorrow will potentially look different. The car will be defined as a computer, as a battery, a motor, and wheels. And that is something that companies like Foxconn, for instance, can produce very effectively and very efficiently. And the cars that you will be able to order, that transport that will come to your house when you need it, will also look different. It will have an office or it will have uh, a small gym it will have a hairdresser. So when you go on your way to your next appointment, you look the works. And it will come in every color as long as it is black. What I'm trying to say is that the car of the future, the buying of the car of the future, and the way we will look at mobility will look completely different. The difficult thing, of course, is to predict how fast that will go. And the big unknown is the role of the regulator. The mobility space and cars are heavily regulated, and we know that some of our suppliers uh, have found it out to their peril. And 
and legislators will find this a, uh, their natural to domain to, uh, to interfere. And one day there will be a self-driving car that will be involved in a fatal accident. And as a result of that, it will make headlines and legislators and politicians will make a flurry of legislation that will stifle innovation. And also, it will take time. I think society will ask time to adapt. I think legislation will be used by incumbents, by society, by people who see their lives changing and their jobs disappearing or changing, and they will ask time to adjust, to find new work to develop new businesses, and so on and so forth. And it's difficult to predict how exactly that will pan out, but I think legislation will have a major effect on the speed of adoption and how this technology will adopt it in the first place. The cars of the future will be maintenance-free. You don't have a dealer network. You don't need insurance anymore. Petrol stations will disappear, and the public space will be redesigned and giving back to, to the citizens and taking away from the car. Um, so, if you ask me for timelines, my guess is that within five years from now, we will have it working, basically. We will deploy the technology on the controlled conditions in parking spaces, non-public spaces. We will learn from that, collect user feedback, adapt, improve, harden. I think five years later, you will see the first commercial deployments of self-driving cars. And as a result of that, you will see a flurry of new businesses evolving, trying to commercialize the new technology, trying to build businesses around that. And as usual, a large proportion of those businesses will fail. Will not achieve the scale, will not achieve the efficiencies that are possible. And then over time, you will see the winners and the losers in that new mobility economy starting to evolve. What are we going to do at TomTom? Tom? Well, we are at the heart of what's going on in, in some of those technologies that need to be deployed to make this a reality. We are building technology and we are building data that allows software developers to pinpoint a car on the road with, within five centimeters of accuracy. We're building data sets for software developers and car makers to test that technology at a large scale. And we are building the simulation tools that software developers need to get those cars working without killing anyone. It's an exciting future. It's going to be a massive change. It is unclear who the winners and the losers are going to be. But it's clear to me that in the next 10 years, more will change in the car industry than the change we have seen in the last 100 years. Thank you very much.